Hi, it's Jen. Welcome to my channel. So today I'm going to be talking about how the brain interprets pleasure. I find this topic to be very empowering because it's concrete science, not opinion. If you take the time to watch this video, you will understand how our brain feels pleasure, and you can use that information to optimize how you feel pleasure in your life. I first personally started learning about pleasure in the brain when I was in 10th grade in high school. I was at Barnes & Noble and I saw this book, The Compass of Pleasure. Um, like the subtitle of it says, how our brains make fatty foods, orgasm, exercise, marijuana, generosity, vodka, learning, and gambling feel so good. So me as this 10th grader, I was like, well, I don't know what half of those things feel like, but um, I was just really interested. And I'm like, that's so cool that you could understand pleasure in your brain. Like pleasure is so important. What makes you happy, what makes you feel good. So I wanted to understand this in greater context, and I'm going to share with you some of the things that I learned from this book. I will show what biologically happens in our brain when we experience pleasure, as well as what happens in the brain when someone becomes addicted to drugs. There is no personal judgment when looking at the brains of addicts, just facts in the brain that may explain why someone may feel the way they I chose to talk about drug addiction in this video because almost everyone has seen examples of this in real life or on TV. And it's very easy to see from an outside perspective. Even if you don't struggle with drug addiction, our brain interprets pleasure pretty much in the same way, no matter what the pleasure stimulus is. So if you have a bad habit, a source of pleasure that you're not sure if it's the right way to get pleasure from, this video may help you out and you'll learn about the brain. And know that you're learning facts and not just opinions about what's happening. Before I get into talking about specific studies regarding drug addiction, I want to give you a brief understanding of the pleasure circuit in the brain. The most important structure for you to know is the blue circle in this picture, the ventral tegmental area, or what I will call it throughout this video, the VTA. In a 1953 study at McGill University, two postdocs named Olds and Milner attempted to implant an electrode to stimulate an area in the brain that controlled sleep and wake cycles. They missed, and that electrode landed by the VTA. Thus, when they chose to send a shock from the electrode, it would stimulate the VTA area. Note that there are no pain receptors in the brain, so a shock in the brain does not hurt. It just activates the brain cells in that region. The researchers found that the rats seemed to enjoy the stimulus, so they set up an apparatus for the rats to press a lever to control how often they received a shock to the VTA. The researchers found that the rats would press the lever up to 7,000 times per hour. The rats would even neglect drinking water, eating, and meeting in order to continue stimulating the brain area. Female rats would even abandon their newborn pups. In the end, these rats needed to be unhooked from the apparatus to prevent them from death by starvation. Okay, so we know what happens in rats when this brain region is stimulated, but what about humans? Well, something like this has been done in humans, twice and the results were tragically similar to those from the rats. The first study was very unethical and would never be done again today. The study was done on a homosexual male in attempts to make him straight, essentially by stimulating the VTA in response to heterosexual pornography. The second study was done on a woman who suffered from chronic pain, and the researchers were attempting to target a region that would end her chronic pain. However, the shock seeped over from that region into the VTA. Most of what I'm talking about today, I found out from the book, The Compass of Pleasure. And um, I'm gonna read to you an excerpt from it, which is actually an excerpt from these studies. So in the study with the homosexual man, this is how they described his interaction with the self-stimulation of the VTA. During these sessions, B19 stimulated himself to a point that both behaviorally and introspectively, he was experiencing an almost overwhelming euphoria and elation and had to be disconnected despite his vigorous protests. And then this is from the research, an excerpt from the research from the woman. At its most frequent, the patient self-stimulated throughout the day, neglecting her personal hygiene and family commitments. A chronic ulceration developed at the tip of the finger used to adjust the amplitude dial, and she frequently tampered with the device in an effort to increase the stimulation amplitude. At times, she implored her family to limit her access to the stimulator, each time demanding its return. 
after a short hiatus. The woman neglecting her hygiene and her family really reminded me of the rat studies. And I'm sure if they did more research on this, they would find that people would also neglect eating and drinking. But that would be highly unethical, so that's not going to happen. So what happens when the VTA is stimulated? When the VTA is stimulated, dopamine is released to different parts of the brain. Studies have shown that feelings of pleasure are directly correlated with the amount of dopamine released from the VTA to these different areas. I am now going to show you what the, this release of dopamine from the VTA looks like. Don't worry about reading the text and the image. I will walk you through what you need to know for the purpose of this video. A brain cell is called a neuron. What you see here is the transmitting end of a neuron from the VTA and the receiving end of another neuron. The space between two neurons where the signal is transmitted from one neuron to another is called the synaptic cleft. Dopamine from the neuron from the VTA is released and then some of those dopamine molecules attach to a receptor on the receiving neuron. That then causes a signaling that makes us feel pleasure. Circled in red is the transporter. Transporters allow the dopamine in the synaptic cleft that have not bonded to the receptors of the receiving cell in a certain amount of time to go back into the releasing cell to be recycled. Drugs like cocaine can block these dopamine transporters, thus allowing dopamine to stay in the synaptic cleft longer. Thus, more dopamine can bond with the dopamine receptors for a longer amount of time, thus sending more signals that cause pleasure. This is how cocaine works to cause pleasure. In general, this understanding of the synaptic cleft is important to understanding any biological explanation for pleasure. Now I want to point out that second structure that was in the first image I showed you. That structure is a nucleus accumbens, and it's in red in this picture. This structure is one of the areas that has dopamine receptors and directly receives dopamine from VTA neurons. The nucleus accumbens is also known to receive an influx of dopamine in response to cocaine consumption. Pictured here are the receiving ends of neurons from the nucleus accumbens in two different rats. The rat on the left was treated with a salt water solution, whereas the rat on the right was treated with cocaine for five days in a row and was then forced into abstinence from cocaine for multiple weeks. This study was done to simulate addiction and abstinence from cocaine in humans. Key components of addiction include developing a tolerance, dependence, and craving. The euphoria first experienced with the drug often goes away during tolerance. I will not be explaining the biological method of tolerance in this video. However, if you would like me to discuss it in a future video, please let me know in the comments below and I can do that for you. Instead, I will be talking about something called sensitization. Sensitization is when a drug addict stops doing a drug for a certain amount of time, and then when they do the drug again, they will feel more euphoria and more pleasure than the first time they ever did that drug. So going back to this picture of the receiving neurons in the nucleus accumbens. As you can see, these neurons have many small branches sticking out from the neurons. These small branches are called dendritic spines. Each of these dendritic spines has multiple receptors for dopamine. You can see that the rat that went through cocaine treatment has a higher density of dendritic spines. This means that there are more dopamine receptors in the neurons in the nucleus accumbens for the rat that was exposed to cocaine and then deprived of it for weeks than the rat that never received cocaine. Thus, if cocaine is reintroduced to this rat, the cocaine would feel even better than the first time the rat ever did cocaine. Thus, this is the final difficult battle a drug addict must overcome when fighting addiction. I know there have been debates as to whether addiction is a moral issue or a neurological issue. Learning about addiction through the brain, I've learned that it is definitely a neurological issue. Yes, maybe it's a moral issue doing the drug for the first few times, but the fact that it changed the structure of your brain makes it undeniable that there's something in the brain going on. So this book, The Compass of Pleasure, has chapters on food, sex, gambling, and virtuous pleasures in addition to uh, a chapter on drugs. So I kind of just went over the chapter on drugs 
And you'll find if you look at the book that the food chapter, the sex chapter, the gambling chapter, and the chapter on virtuous pleasures follows very similar themes as the drug chapter, as in there are brain changes in your brain that happen for each of these pleasures, and they're all very similar. Um, I wish I could go into all of them in this video, but I don't have the time for this video because I don't want you guys to be watching a video for an hour. But if you are interested in me making a video, please let me know so I could do one on food, on sex, on gambling, or virtuous pleasure, which includes stuff like exercising and charity. Feel free to share this video with anyone who you think might find this interesting, whether they're interested in learning more about the brain or drug addiction, um, they might really enjoy it. Um, also, please like the video if you liked it. It actually makes it easier to find my video on YouTube if you like it. And it will also let me know that you want more videos like this. Um, yeah, and feel free to subscribe. Um, I like to make videos about self-improvement. This is my first video about neuroscience, but it's a big passion of mine, and I think it relates to self-improvement. So if you like it, please like the video, let me know, and I'll keep making neuroscience videos just for you. Okay, bye.